we're in the month of May, I feel like we've officially entered spring here at our farm. So I figured I'd take this opportunity and give you guys a tour of the farm and see how things are doing and how they fared through the winter. So uh, let's go. Actually, wait, first thing I should probably show you right here, if you wanna look. So this sign used to be out in front of the farm. Unfortunately, an errant snowplow actually knocked it off and so I've got to replace it. It's starting to get kind of banged up and weathered and it was never really a sealed wooden sign for outdoors to begin with. So I think I might retire this somewhere indoors and actually try to figure out a way to make a nice official sign for out front. So uh, stay tuned on that one. So over here, you'll notice we still have a mobile chicken tractor duck house sitting here. I've got Samuel and Jemima Puddle Duck in here. They're hanging out, they're pretty happy, they're pretty content. Sometimes I'll let them go down by the puddles over by the road. But I gotta watch them because I don't want them to get hit by a car. I keep hoping that Jemima goes broody so I've been leaving her eggs in here. And every morning when I come out and uh, take care of them, she's always sitting there and she usually likes to sit right on top of them but she's not sitting long enough to hatch them. So I don't know, they might be a lost cause. I will probably bring the puddle ducks back to the other ducks pretty soon. I just want to give the khaki Campbells a chance to heal up, uh, especially after that mink attack. In terms of plans for the barn, number one, I want to say thank you to everybody out there who has just been so generous and supportive of us as we've been working to try to raise some extra funds to help us repair the barn. As I've noted in previous videos, we didn't get the state grant to repair it, but we are still pushing ahead to make sure we can save our barn. Uh, specifically this year, I've worked out a plan with a friend of mine who's going to do some patching on the roof. And we're also going to clean up this whole mess and seal this off. Um, so it's going to be a combination of some help that I'm hiring as well as myself and a friend who's helping out. Like my buddy Alfred's going to come by and he's got an excavator and we're going to pull out all of this rubble and set it aside and we're going to build one gigantic pile with it. Um, probably in the fall, once we get our first snow, we'll have a bonfire. Fire! 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 <laughs> and actually, let me show you one way that we're using our barn to raise animals this year. So inside here is where I'm going to be brooding our goslings. I got to do a little cleanup. Um, still a little bit messy from when I brooded the ducks in here last year. But this is going to be my brooder space. It's really the only room in the entire barn that I can actually seal up tight. So in a couple of weeks when all of our little baby goslings show up here on the farm, I'm going to set them up right in here. Um, we're getting about 50 of them and this should be just enough space for the first three weeks with them. And then after that I'm going to be putting them outside. Still with heat lamps, but outside so that they can have access to fresh pasture. I'm really excited for those goslings when they show up here on the farm in a couple of weeks. It's going to be pretty cool. So this is the uh, garden portion of the farm. Uh, right behind me is Allison's kitchen garden. We are just starting to get some uh, seedlings going and Hopefully we'll put them in probably by about June 1st-ish or so. Given our weather, we've got to give it plenty of time uh, before our last frost. Just the other day we were still getting snow. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the challenge of gardening in a northern climate. You know, Allison does such a wonderful job. These beds have already been prepped. Uh, back in the fall I kept the ducks here for almost two weeks and they have just completely gone through and gotten through any sort of nesting insects and disrupted it. They pooped everywhere. They ate up a lot of the leftovers. They did a good job helping us manage the garden and so now it's it's ready to be planted and uh, we're pretty excited about it. The fencing that we use here on our garden, uh, it's pretty simple but it's pretty effective too. Um, it's basically just uh, wooden garden stakes paired with chicken wire and then I use uh, some strips of rebar for support posts. I put it in last spring and I'm actually really pleased with how well it's held up through the winter. It doesn't really need much of a repair at all, so um, we got that going for us. So over here is where I've got my fledgling tree nursery. Um, it's just the start, but I really actually have big ambitions for this space. 
Right here is a whole bed of what should hopefully become wild apples. Last fall, my friend Rachel and I actually went scrumping, which is stealing roadside apples, and we pressed it into cider. And it made some awesome, awesome hard cider that we got to enjoy around the Christmas, New Year's time. But it also left me with a whole bunch of pulp. I ended up spreading this pulp out here and I'm hoping that little baby wild apple seedlings start to spring up pretty soon. Some, some people are totally against the idea of growing wild apples, but I think it's like a lottery ticket. You know, maybe about one in three or one in four of them actually turn out to be good apples, whether they're used for vinegar or cider or eating. And so uh, I hope I can discover some new strains of apples in this little bed. Now back here, where I have this landscaping fabric put down, that's where I'm gonna keep all of my baby chestnut seedlings and black locust seedlings. Right now, I have a bucket full of black locust seeds. In an upcoming video, what I'm gonna do is actually show you guys how to sprout black locust seedlings. And on top of that, I have a bucket right back there that has uh, chestnuts sprouting in it. My plan is I'm gonna take the seedlings from there and plant them all along in here. I'm gonna let them grow for about two years before I put them out in the permaculture orchard. Now, I know this can probably blow up in my face, but I figured now would be a good time to check on those sprouting chestnuts. I haven't looked at them since uh, I put them in the ground back in November. I wonder how they're doing. They could be mush, they could be covered in fungus, they could be eaten by an animal, or they could be sprouting little tails and be ready to be turned into tree seedlings. Let's uh, go check it out, come on. The mystery of Al Capone's vaults will continue after these messages. The reason why I've waited so long before checking on these things is as recently as, I don't know, two weeks ago, this whole area was still covered in about a foot of snow. So uh, let's see what's inside, huh? Doesn't look like any animals got in, so that's good. So I buried it in moist sand. The sand still feels damp. Oh, look at that. See? Do you look at that? You got a little chestnut sprouting right there. That is pretty darn cool. If you guys want to see a video of me making this little nut here into a seedling now that it's sprouted, uh, post a comment down below and I'll try to make a video if you're interested. But until I make that video, I'm gonna keep these guys stashed in here to be safe and sound. I always try to put something heavy like a rock on top of this because I don't want a rodent to get in here and have a feast. So now this brings us to the duck area. My latest solution has been to actually focus on electric fencing for them. As you guys can see, right, I've got electric poultry netting all the way around the duck house as a way to keep it safer from predators. I've also put hardware cloth along the edges. The other thing I've done is I've actually taken landscape fabric and put it all the way around the duck house like a weird little moat. The reason I'm doing this is because I plan to keep this fence here for a long time, like, I don't know, at least two or three months. And I don't want to have to deal with grass and weeds. I want to keep this fence as hot as possible. So if any predators come this way, they get the bejesus shocked out of them and they leave my ducks alone. But at the same time, I know that this duck house is not gonna be the duck house of the future. So that's why right here in this duck yard where I'm standing now, I'm ultimately gonna build a new duck house. I think I mentioned this in a previous video, but it's definitely something that's in the works. So where I'm taking you now is over to our stream. I'm pretty sure this is where the mink came up to attack the ducks. And I've been doing some pretty aggressive trapping around here with live traps and another type of trap. Last night, this trap got knocked over and dragged around. Um, I've been using sardines inside a can for bait, and so I'm pretty sure something big tried to get in there. I actually picked up on the trail camera a bear. It's kind of hard to see, but 
and you can just make out the outline of a bear trying to get there. I worry a little bit that my attempt to try to trap the mink is backfiring and it's attracting bears, which would be an even bigger problem. There's a hole in the bucket, dear Liza, dear Liza. In case you guys are curious though, this is our stream. It's uh, running pretty hard right now. Usually it's pretty easy to walk right across it. I wonder what kind of track that is. Think that's a raccoon? Maybe? I don't know, it looks a little big for a raccoon. Uh, but it's probably a raccoon. Whatever it was, I was walking right down around here. You can see the nails of it. Here we have the ducks working the pasture. I've been out here working most of the afternoon today, so I'm just letting them roam free. They really enjoy it. They're just going through, picking up bugs and worms, having a good old time. And then behind the ducks is the permaculture orchard. So our permaculture orchard sits in an area that's about six and a half acres in size and consists of about 600 trees and shrubs. I call it a permaculture orchard because it is modeled after the design principles of a guy by the name of Stefan Subkobiak. He does some pretty innovative stuff in terms of regenerative agriculture. He's uh, just outside of Montreal. It's, uh, it's, it's some pretty cool stuff that he does. But the patterns that I'm using are unique to us in our farm here. We have a mix of chestnuts, elderberry, mulberry, apple, butternut, Siberian pea shrub, and black locust primarily. Uh, a couple of other things like Humphrey uh, scattered in here as well. So we planted the trees in the fall of 2017. Most of them were year old bare root seedlings. Like you can see here, this is a nice big black locust. This thing's probably darn near 10 feet now. Look at those thorns, that's something. People often ask me, why do I bother planting black locusts? And it's a couple reasons. Number one is that it's good for the soil and the surrounding plants. Number two, it's fast growing and it's, it makes for good lumber. It's very rot resistant. In number three, I hear you can actually use the branches as fodder for livestock. So these are all part of our future farming plans wrapped up in these black locust trees. Here's an elderberry. Let's see how this guy's doing. Some of these dead branches. A lot of it's doing pretty good. Some new fresh growth coming in here. Let's check out this chestnut tree here. last year's leaves but look you can start to see some buds are coming you got some fibers on the tree that's gonna be a good healthy chestnut tree seedling a lot of people ask me if there was one tree that I'd plant what would it be I have to say that my favorite tree that we have here is the chestnut I think chestnuts are just such an awesome food crop I think the wood is outstanding and I always find it to be such a tragedy what happened to the American chestnut and how uh, a blight in the 20th century really wiped out most of the American chestnuts. And so, you know, trying to bring back chestnuts is one of those things that personally I think is, is such a good cause. And so if you're out there watching this video, trying to come up with which tree you should plant at your homestead or farm, look at the chestnut. It's so underrated. I think if everybody planted more chestnut trees, 10 or 15 years from now, we would just be in such a better place from an agricultural standpoint here in the United States. So, uh, yeah. So I use these tree tubes to both help our trees grow straight, help protect them from pests like deer and rodents, and to give them a little growing head start because these things act as a greenhouse. I made a video about them last fall and one of the things I stated in the video was I was having problems with having little birds get caught inside the tree tube. See this? Feathers. By my count, I found seven dead birds trapped in these tree tubes. Well, the manufacturer wrote to me and told me that they now make these little nylon covers that they put on top of the tubes to help protect birds. And so they're actually gonna send me a bunch of them and I'm gonna put them on in the near future. Do you 
see that? There's a little barn cat, hopefully looking for some voles. She's been stalking the orchard a lot lately, which is awesome in my book. Um, you know, while I hope she doesn't attack any birds, the, the rodents, she is sort of open season for those, and so we'll see how she does. I like watching her because she's like a lioness on the Serengeti. So this giant pile of mulch right behind me needs to get spread out and put on a bunch of trees. Since we're now in May, this is the month that I have to really get in here and spread mulch on every single one of our trees. I do it twice a year, do it once in the spring and once in the fall. I only have two major activities in terms of maintenance of the permaculture orchard, and this is one of those two. So you got the mulching and then you got mowing. I try to mow this as much as possible, doing it every couple of weeks. You know, it's a pretty big space, but it's not horrible. I only brush hog the top of our pasture about twice a year, but here in the permaculture orchard, I'm doing it very regularly because it's how you keep down on uh, weeds and overgrowth around the trees, as well as rodents that might eat the trees or damage them. So those are the two big activities, mulching and mowing. We've got over 160 acres here on our farm. Um, most of it's woods. And there are so many adventures you can have just wandering through our woods. And now that all the snow's melted, I'm really looking forward to enjoying that. The other part that I'm not going to really show you in this video is we just got a lot of pasture. Someday, somehow, I'm going to have animals that can graze that pasture. But right now, all I'm trying to do is take good care of it. You guys want to see something cool? Look at this. Let's see if I can pick it up in the camera here. I'm not sure if you can quite see it, but... The White Mountains, the presidential range, is way back there. So you can see it just out past our farm. You know, like Mount Washington's out there and a couple of other mountains that are named after presidents. They're all over the border in New Hampshire, but they're not too far from us here at Goldshaw Farm. So if you guys are new to our farm, you might be wondering what all of these humps are in these trenches. Well, they're known as swales and berms. So the swale is the ditch, the berm is the hump that you see over here. The purpose of the swales and berms is actually to capture water and distribute the water, particularly around the trees. We don't do any irrigation here. We don't water any of our trees. We just let them do their thing and, and let nature be nature. But what we've tried to do is shape the earth a little bit so that it can actually help the trees grow. And so what happens is when we have a big rainfall or like we're just coming off of a big snow melt, a lot of water gets trapped in these trenches and it sits here and then it's used to feed those trees that, that are on the other side. Or at least that's the theory. So far, I think they've worked as they've been designed to work. Um, they follow the levelness of the ground, so they do a pretty good job of even distribution. They definitely capture water and hold water a lot longer than the rest of the pasture, no question about that. They are a little bit of a headache, and I didn't anticipate this when I put them in because they're really hard to mow around, but, I don't know, I think there's some potential. And I like how they mark the property. Like if you look at a big wide shot of the farm, you can just see these ridges that go all the way up the hill. And it's kind of cool. I dream of someday having, you know, big, big trees all along here. And then having, you know, cattle and sheep and geese and chickens just going through these alleyways, grazing and eating and, you know, participating in the farm. It's, it's just my attempt to try to mimic nature and, and have a restorative agriculture system. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to totally work. I've failed in certain areas already, but I've also had some successes. And really what I'm trying to do here is just keep trying and trying and trying. And that's something I'm trying to do with my farm as a whole. The idea here isn't to be perfect or do everything right. It's to do everything the best I can, learn from my mistakes, and continue to keep growing and building here at Goldshaw Farm.